All right. Today we're, we're going to talk about current and resistance. In this uh, session, we're going to define electric current, and then we're going to consider the relationship between current, voltage, and resistance, which is called the Ohm's law, and then uh, talk about current density and resistivity, and uh, also microscopic uh, form of Ohm's law. And then we talk about relationship between resistivity and resistance and drift velocity and electric power. And at the end, we talk about uh, change of resistance with temperature. All right, so this is a very simple chapter. So get, let's get started. Um, electric current in a wire is defined as the amount of charge passing through any cross section of the wire per unit time. We write I equal to delta Q over delta T. And uh, if you want to be more precise, you can say I equal to dQ over dt, instead rate of change of Q with respect to time, how much charge passes uh, in a very short delta T. And the unit of current, I didn't put it here, unit of current is, as you see, unit of charge, which is Coulomb per second. So uh, we have a name for that, we call it an amp, and we denote it by capital A. And here is a circuit that shows a battery and a piece of the wire, which is all the same, and a light bulb. And uh, this shows the cross section of the wire a little bit more obviously, and the current passes through uh, this circuit. It's the, uh, the battery causes the current to pass through, and as a result of current passing through the uh, very thin uh, filament here, it lights up. But if you look at the current, it is actually uh, the um, are thought to be positive charges moving in the direction of the current. But then later on, we realize that no, there are negative charges that are electrons are moving in the direction opposite to the uh, current that has the exact same effect as positive charges would move in the positive direction. So if you want to uh, make an experiment like that, a battery here and a resistor, a, a, an, a sample of some object, some uh, object that can conduct electricity, doesn't have to be perfect conductor, but it, it is uh, a conductor of electricity. Then you see that um, the, if you increase the voltage, the current increases in this circuit, in everywhere the same circuit, um, the current increases by increasing voltage. So voltage and current are proportional to each other. And we write V is proportional to I. And the uh, coefficient of proportionality here is called the resistance of this sample because all the other wires are considered uh, good conductors. The resistance is only uh, because of this resistor here. And we, we say that the proportionality factor is that resistance and we define denoted by R. So we write V equals RI or IR, doesn't matter. Uh, the unit of R is volt per amp. As you see, this is the unit of V is volt the potential difference divided by the unit of current, which is amps. So this unit is called O and it is uh, denoted by a capital uh, omega letter, uh, let, Greek letter omega. And um, so one O, we call it O, is one volt divided by amp, all right? Or one volt divided by amp this way. So this is, uh, the way the uh, units are related. And this V equals Ri is called Ohm's law uh, after the scientist Ohm. And there are some uh, color resistors that uh, the strips of color uh, shows how much resistance it has. You uh, probably uh, hear about that in the lab 
that each color is representative of a number. So black is zero, brown is one, red is two. And you start from one side, this, this first color is very close to one side of the resistor uh, as opposed to the other one. So the way you read the resistance of a resistor is that you put the first digit and second digit, and then you multiply that 10, by 10 to the power of the third color. And the last one shows the tolerance, means how much uh, uncertainty this value has. So in this case, you see there's a uh, uh, green, green is five, and then there is a violet, violet is seven. So you write five, seven, so it becomes 57 times uh, 10 to the power of multiplier. Multiplier is red, red, which is two. So 10 to the power two. So this is five, 57 times 10 to the second power means 5,700 ohms. And then the tolerance shows if it is silver, it shows that it has 10% uh, error. And if it is gold, it has 5% error. So it means that it's 5,700 has an error about uh, 570 or about 600 uh, uncertainty. So the resistance is about, you know, uh, between 5,100 to 6,300, right? So, uh, so the tolerance is 10% of the original amount. This 5,700 uh, becomes 5.7 times 10 to the third, which is kilo we say 5.7 kilo, all right? This is a color resistor, just wanted to mention here. Any questions so far? So we have Ohm's law, V equals to RI, that uh, applies to every um, uh, resistor, the potential difference across it and the current going through it and its, its resistance. These are related by this formula. And the unit of resistance is Ohm. So what is current density? The current density of a uniform current I through a wire of cross-section area A is denoted by J and is defined by the current through the cross-section divided by the cross-sectional area. So J is equal to I over A. In general, this is a vector. Unit of J is amps per meter square, right? So uh, we don't have a name for it. We, we just say amps per unit square, per unit uh, per meter squared. And uh, so when you have a current, for example, if, if the cross section changes, the same current goes through everywhere. So in, in here, you have the same current with larger cross section. So current density is lower. In here, you have the same current and smaller cross section. So the current density is larger. And in general, as I said, the current density is a vector in the direction of the current at any point. So it means that at this point is in this direction. Actually, these are current, uh, lines, uh, of velocity lines of the charges. So at this point, it is in this direction, it's parallel to this point, at parallel to this line at any point. So, um, uh, is a vector in the direction of the current at any point, the net current through any surface S is given by uh, I equal to integral over the surface of J dot dA. So if you have a surface, for example, in here, and uh, you, at any point there is a J means current density, and you have dA that is defined the same as before, and uh, that we had uh, integral e dot dA, for example, you see this is the normal component of the current density uh, uh, to the surface times the, the surface uh, element of surface area. If you add all of them, uh, first the current density times element of surface becomes the small current that passes through that surface at that uh, particular element, through that particular element. And then if you add all of them, you get the total current passing through the surface. So this is a more general 
consideration of this, but we don't usually use that. We just use this uh, simple case because usually the current density is uniform for us. But if the current density is not uniform, there are some, a couple of problems that are like that, then you have to use this formula. All right, any question? Is current density very simple? Uh, is current divided by area? And then resistivity uh, and microscopic Ohm's law. We have a, a resistivity defined this way. If you have a piece of um, object like this cylinder, the potential, uh, the electric potential across the sample uh, set up an electric field along the length of the sample. So when you have an electric potential from here to here, like it's connected to a battery, then this uh, potential difference is corresponding to an electric field uh, that uh, is throughout this sample. Because, you know, integral of E dot DL becomes the delta V, the potential difference, remember? This electric field causes electrons to move in the opposite direction of the current, of course. And as a result, a current density J is created at any point inside the material, which is proportional to the electric field intensity E. So the, the larger the electric field is, the faster the electrons move. And of course, the, uh, it is because the electrons, as they are moving, they hit the atoms in, uh, or molecules in front in, in the sample, so they slow down. So the, the larger the electric field is, uh, the faster they move because there's friction. It's like air friction for them. So electric field is proportional to the current density. And again, there's a proportionality factor. Uh, the proportionality factor in this case is called resistivity of the material. So it, we denote it by rho. Uh, is Greek letter rho, we use this for uh, charge density as well, we use for mass density, and in this case, uh, in this particular case, we use it for resistivity of the material, and then we write uh, E equal to rho times J, and it, it shows that, uh, in fact, J is a vector that is in the direction of the electric field, and it has a um, resistivity rho. Uh, the rho is uh, depending on the material only. So that for some materials, rho is large. For some material, rho is small. You see that if uh, it takes large electric field to make a, um, make a current density, certain current density, it means that rho is large. And that, is mean, that means that the material is more uh, toward um, resistive or less conducting. And uh, more conductors usually have very low resistivity. Uh, that's why elect, uh, with the electric field, a small electric field creates a large current. And therefore, it, uh, the current actually create, uh, separates the charges and if you don't provide the current and the electric field drops and uh, stabilized. This equation is called microscopic version of the Ohm's law, as opposed to V equal to uh, Ri. Say this is E equal to rho j. And the inverse of resistivity rho is called conductivity of the material denoted by sigma. So sigma is one over rho, Rho is called conductivity. If uh, something has large resistivity, it has low conductivity and vice versa. So for example, metals have very low resistivity, very large conductivity. Uh, plastic, wood, and these kinds of things have very large resistivity and very small conductivity. The units of resistivity are ohms meet, ohm meter. How is that? Um, you can write uh, resistivity, unit of resistivity. Let me write down. Unit of resistivity can be written as unit of electric field 
divide by unit of uh, J. So uh, unit of rho is unit of E, which is, uh, you can say, uh, volt per meter, I guess, you can say volt per meter electric field can be written as volt per meter or Coulomb per, uh, sorry, Newton per Coulomb. Or, and J can be written as amps per meter squared, right? So one of the meters cancel, get volt over, over amps times meter. And volt over amp, we just said that is an O. So it, it is O times meter. Okay, so unit of resistivity is O meter. Any questions about that? And then this, this is a table that shows resistivity uh, for some material. And as you see in here, we, we have metals with very low resistivity of the order of 10 to the negative eight, right? These are all silver, copper, gold, aluminum, and all of that. You see they are in the order of 10 to negative eight. And these are some alloys, which is the mix, mixture of different material, different conductors. They also have uh, very small resistivity. And then we have semiconductors. Semiconductors have resistivity uh, much bigger uh, than these. So in the order C from negative 10 to negative five to 10 to, 10 to the third and uh, especially pure silicon is, is like that. And then insulators, which is like glass, uh, wood, and uh, things like that have resistivity much, much higher, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15, and so forth. You see, these are very, very uh, large resistivity, it means that they are not really conducting much uh, uh, elect electricity. So that's why we call them insulators. And conductors uh, have very, very low resistivity. That's why we use them as, you know, to transfer uh, current or move the current around. And we use those like uh, amber or glass. We don't use glass or Teflon, for example, uh, to, to use the cover for copper wires that we want to send electricity and we, want, we don't want it to you know, uh, leak away from the wire. So we, we put insulators around them. But these uh, semiconductors have very, very in interesting um, uh, characteristics that you can change their resistivity by doping other materials into them. And uh, so you can um, make it uh, become a little bit uh, more resistive or less resistive by applying a voltage. And that gives us, uh, I mean, we're not going to talk about that. If you are in electrical engineering, you're going to talk, uh, study about that in a lot of details. And in, in fact, you can change the resistivity of these material when, when they are doped with some uh, impurities uh, greatly, and that gives us a tool to make switches by just applying electric uh, voltages. And this revolutionized uh, the science of electronics or technology of electronics. And that's why you see, uh, for example, these computers working, your computer and whatever you're using to, to hear this uh, lecture. Uh, is using a lot of these uh, semiconductors. And <clears throat> the, the most famous or most used semiconductor is silicon. And that's why, for example, the uh, San Francisco area uh, is called Silicon Valley because they, there are a lot of computer, um, uh, computer uh, firms and companies are there. Google is there, IBM and all that. So it's called Silicon Valley. And this is the main ingredient of making transistors and uh, switches. Uh, and 
before that, there were large uh, lamps that uh, used they used for switch, or it was a, um, uh, some manual switches. So it was very hard to make anything. But now, because of the silicons, uh, they they can make switches very very small and very efficient. And that revolutionized electronics. But we are not going to talk about that. Unfortunately, we're just going to. Uh, talk about the basic science behind uh, this uh, current and resist resistivity. All right, any questions? All right, so we have conductors and insulators. The difference is resistivity. Some you see this is 10 to negative eight, these are 10 to 14, but there's an order of magnitude of 10 to 22, which is a huge number. All right. What is the relationship between resistivity and resistance? Resistivity uh, is, the, is the characteristic of the material, uh, but resistance is a characteristic of a, a sample of the material that has something to do with the material that is used in it, and also the dimensions of the sample. Now, Consider a, cylindric, a cylinder of length L, cross-sectional area A, made of a material of resistivity rho, is subjected to potential difference V across it. So potential is higher here, lower here, and the length of this cylinder is L. The area, cross-sectional area is A. We know that the, the electric field is from higher potential to lower potential, so therefore, when you, when you set up a potential difference, the electric field uh, creates a current density and current density creates a current. And we want to see what is the difference, <coughs> excuse me, what is the relationship between resistivity of this material and the resistance of this sample? From the microscopic Ohm's law, we have E equal to rho times J. Remember, E was the electric field, J was the current density, rho was resistivity. But electric field also is equal to V over L because V is E times L, remember? And the current density is J, which is I over L. So if we uh, write V over L, which is the electric field, should be equal to rho times j, which is a over a. So this is, sorry, i over a. So rho i over a. If you write this in terms of these two, replace electric field by v over l, re replace j by i over a, this equation becomes like this. And then replacing v by ri, because Ohm's law applies, v equals to r times i and solving for R. So uh, when you write R I, I cancels, you get R over L equals to rho over A. And then you multiply by L, you get rho R equal to rho L over A. And this is the relationship between resistivity and resistance. And it shows that resistance of an object like this is the resistivity of the material times the length of the object, the cylinder, divided by cross-sectional area. What does it mean? It means that the longer it is, the larger resistance. And the thinner it is, means the area is smaller, the resistance is larger, which is kind of intuitive. If it is a larger cross-section, there's more current passes through it easily, so resistance is less. All right? So, so the, uh, this gives resistance of the cylinder sample in terms of the, its geometry, length and cross-sectional area and the resistivity of its material. Any questions? So very simple. Uh, this is one of our uh, pro our formulas here in this chapter. All right, what is drift velocity? The current in a wire, 
is the result of the average velocity of charges in the wire that is referred to as drift velocity. For example, here, see when the uh, charges move, they move on average but at certain speed, we call it drift velocity. It depends on the magnitude of the current density J at each point. The, uh, and also it depends on the charge of each uh, charge carrier, which is in this case, for example, electrons, and the number of charge carriers per unit volume which we call N. So this um, drift velocity VD depends on uh, J and Q and N. J is the current density in the material. Q is the charge of each carrier. And N is the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Now we want to see how they are related. Consider the the short section of the wire shown in the figure. It, this, uh, this short section that has a cross-sectional area A, and it has this small length of uh, drift velocity times dt. So we're going to do that. This, uh, this is, um, as if you assume that the electrons or uh, charges are moving with the speed Vd, during that time dt, they move this long, uh, they cover this distance in the wire. So dx is vd times dt, okay? And this is that drift velocity is equal to dx dt, right? It's uh, the same thing. And then uh, the number of the charge, uh, number of charges in this volume, in this volume is the uh, number of uh, charge carrier per unit volume times the volume. So it becomes N times, this is the volume, N times the volume. Volume is area times the distance dx, right? So the number of charges that are in this uh, small volume is charge per unit volume times the volume of that part. The volume is written as area times the length and cross-sectional area times length, and the length is uh, dx, which is Vd times dt, all right? And then uh, how much charge is there? The charge is, the charge that is there is uh, this number of charge carriers times charge of each carrier, right? Amount of moving charge in that section is dq, which is n times q. So dq becomes nqa vd times dt. And then if you divide this uh, equation by dt, you get dq dt, dq over dt becomes the current. So the current is dq dt. So the current becomes nqa times vd, drift velocity. So we, we can write, the current in terms of the number of the charge carrier per unit volume, N, the charge of each charge carrier, the cross-sectional area times the drift velocity. And then if you divide this equation by A, the cross-sectional area, then the current divided by cross-sectional area is the current density. So J is I over A, and then therefore J becomes NQ times V drift. All right, so we have the current density in terms of these parameters and the current in terms of these parameters. All right, this drift velocity is uh, usually very small, you will see. And N is very large in, the, in metals. Uh, we are going to have an example that shows that. Any questions? All right, let's look at this example. Find the drift speed of electrons in a copper wire of diameter one millimeter. So the diameter of the copper wire is one millimeter and it has a current of one amp. You know, one amp is a large current. 
is like means that one coulomb of charge per second passes through the cross section. That's a very large uh, amount of charge for each second, right? So it's a large current. Usually uh, in the labs, sometimes we have several amps, but that's rare. And uh, sometimes we have just a milliamp, a couple of milliamps, all right, in normal circuits or microamps in some, some cases. All right, how do we find the drift speed? In order to find that, we need to find the number of charge carriers per unit volume for copper because the material is copper, right? Let me, let me do that by hand. It's um, boring this way. So, so uh, for, for copper, we have this information. We have um, mass density of copper, which is uh, uh, mass density of car, uh, copper is 8960 means 8,960 kilogram per meter cube. And we have the molar mass of the current um, copper as 63.5 because it is 64 and 63, I guess there are two different isotopes and they are almost the same. Uh, they are different isotopes and they have some uh, abundance in nature, but in, in general, the, uh, uh, mass, uh, atomic mass of uh, copper on average becomes 63.5. What does it mean? It means that there is an Avogadro number in one mole, Avogadro number of at atoms, uh, copper atoms is 63.5 grams. So uh, this 63.5 uh, grams is proportional to N of a god row of ad, uh, atoms, copper atoms, uh, Cu atoms. Right? So uh, an N of a god row is, uh, uh, you, you know, 6.02 6 times 10 to the 23rd, right? Of uh, Cu atoms. CU, like say atoms, is equal to uh, 63.5 gram, and we can convert it to kilogram, becomes 0 0.0635 kilogram, right? So we have so much, uh, this many atoms have this much weight, all right? So if we, uh, if we divide these two, because uh, we get uh, six times 10 to the, 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms per kilogram. So divide by 0 0.0635, we get a large number, which is num uh, the number of atoms per each kilogram of copper, all right? So it becomes, how much is that? Um, is, I don't have a calculator here with me. Can somebody calculate that for me, please? So that becomes about uh, 6 divided by 6.5 times 10 to the 4, about 9 point something times 10 to the 24th uh, atoms per kilogram, 9.44, yes, thank you. Oops, 9.44 times 10 to the 24, um, uh, atoms per kilogram. And now we have in one cubic meter of copper, we have 8,960 kilogram of copper. So if this, this many atoms per kilogram in 8960 kilogram, we have so much more atoms. So if you multiply 9.44 times 10 to the 24 uh, atoms per kilogram, 
then you multiply this by multiply this by um, 8960 uh, kilogram per meter cubed, you get the number of atoms per meter cubed. And this comes to uh, V8.49 times 10 to the 28th atoms per meter cubed. All right. So this is a large number. This is, in fact, n, the number of atoms. OK, this is the number of atoms, not the number of charge carriers. But for conductors like uh, copper, uh, essentially, every atom contributes one electron to the conduction uh, band of the, uh, of the sample. So every atom contributes one electron. So the number of electrons that are moving around is the same as the number of atoms that are in the sample. So therefore, there is so many uh, electrons that are per cubic meter that are in the, uh, in the sample. So that is N. And now, we want to find the drift velocity. We remember I is uh, N, Q, and uh, N, Q, A drift velocity. And then if you want to find V drift is equal to I divide by N times Q times, sorry, don't need that big a, um, I divide by NQ times A. Now we can put the numbers in. I is just one amp, everything is I unit, so I don't write the unit. I is one amp. N is this number, 8.49 times 10 to the 28th. And then N is the charge of each carrier, which is electron, so 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. An A cross sectional area, if the diameter is one millimeter, we can write, you see, the area is pi r squared. But in terms of the diameter, because D is r over two, becomes pi over four d squared. So it becomes pi over four times d squared, which is 10 to the negative three squared, right? So you just need to multiply all these numbers. You see this 10 to negative three squared becomes 10 to negative six and times 10 to negative 19 becomes 10 to the uh, 20, negative 25. With this 10 to the 28 becomes 10 to, 10 to the third power in the denominator. It comes up, becomes uh, 10 to the negative three. So 10 to negative three divide by 8.49 times 1.6 times pi over four, right? So you see that if you, if you calculate that, this is uh, about 0 0.09 something, you can calculate that, uh, times 10 to the negative three. And the unit is meters per second. So it becomes millimeter per second. All right, so what is that number? See, 0 0.09, it is less than 0 0.1 millimeter per second. Means that you, for this uh, one amp current that goes through the wire, it has a small cross section, one millimeter is not much. You have to wait 10 seconds for the electrons to move on average one millimeter along the wire. All right. It's very, very slow. And if you make it 10 amps, then they go about one millimeter per hour, per, per second. So uh, any questions on this? I'm going to show the printing of the, all of that. Assuming that each copper atom contributes one con uh, conduction electron to the sample, the number of charge carriers is the same as the number of atoms in the volume. So N is 8960 divide by, this is kilogram per meter cube, divide by kilogram per mole becomes 
mole per meter cube. And then for each mole, we have 6.2, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole. So it becomes number of atoms per meter cubed. So it becomes 84.9 times 10 to the 28 atoms per meter cubed, that's N. And this is I, VD becomes one over I over NQA. And these are the same calculation becomes 0 0.094 millimeters per second. All right, so it is very, very small, uh, small speed. But then if you look at the, what's going on in the, in the sample, this is a uh, busy figure I need to explain. See, this is the conductor without internal electric field, it means that conductor that doesn't have any electric field, so there's no current in it. So uh, this blue line that you see with arrows on them, it, you, it is the random motion of an electron because there is temperature and it, um, everything is moving inside. The electrons are moving very fast. And uh, on average, when there is no electric field, it is like air molecules that are moving in, in the air in random directions. And in general, you don't have a drift. You don't have a um, draft in, in terms of, uh, for air, we, we don't have a wind that moves around. But do you, do you guys know that the, the average, do you know the average speed of the air molecules in the air at room temperature? Does anybody know that? There's a, there's a formula to calculate that. V, v is equal to, you can, you can use one half mv squared, the average v average. Uh, this is average kinetic energy of the air molecules or any gas uh, molecule or gas atom, atom of ideal gas is equal to one, uh, actually three half kT, three half kB Boltzmann constant times the temperature in Kelvin. Boltzmann constant is uh, 1.3, Eight, I think, times 10 to the negative 23 uh, joules per Kelvin. And if you use that, you can find V average to be one half cancel, you get square root of uh, 3kbt divided by m. If you, if you calculate that for the air molecules, with the m is mass of one air molecule, which is like hydrogen, uh, sorry, uh, oxygen or nitrogen, we can put the average of those two, 29, uh, 29 times the mass of a proton. And uh, Kb is very small, T temperature is about 300 Kelvin. If you put that, you see that the average speed of air molecules in the air in uh, room temperature is about 500 meters per second, very, very fast and you are being bombarded by the air molecules with that speed, all right? And probably they, they hit your skin, they go to your skin because it's like a bullet shot into your skin. <laughs> but of course they are light and they stop fast and sometimes they bounce back. All right, so they're going that fast. The air molecules are going that fast and you see that it is the same Kb and T for anything in that temperature. But for electrons, this m is much smaller. For electrons, this m is 10 to negative 31st, which is two, about uh, 10,000 times uh, or 50,000 times smaller than a molecule of oxygen or nitrogen. And uh, if, if that is that much smaller, means that the um, uh, Electrons inside the wire at room temperature, they're going about, um, what is the square root of 50,000? Becomes about, um, if it is uh, 10,000, it was 100 times bigger, right? About 100 and, or 
200 times bigger speed in they're going at the speed of about to 100,000, yeah, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the fifth meters per second. Very, very fast. This is the average speed of electrons inside the wire. So they go with this average speed in random, random direction like that, and they hit each other, they hit the atoms and bounce back and forth. And on average, if you look at the cross section of the wire, there's the same number of electrons passing through to the right and the same as this, the number passing through to the left. So there's no net current. But when you apply electric field, uh, as they are going like crazy back and forth, they drift slowly to one direction, as you see, which is exaggerated um, uh, departure from the random, the red uh, lines. So, if you have electric field, as the electron is moving along, you know, the random motion, it drifts a little bit to the right. Uh, or yes, in this case, to the left, right. All right, and then uh, there's a current to the left because electrons are going to the right. And you see the, the vast difference between these two speeds. The speed is 10 to the five. The other one is 10 to the negative one, negative four. So they are, the random speed of electrons is about a billion times bigger than this drift velocity, okay? Which is very interesting. As you see, you know, in the air, you can have a draft of, you now the air in the uh, air in around you may move at like a couple of centimeters per second, but they are moving, the air molecules in fact are moving at 500 meters per second. So that's not as dramatic as this, but it is dramatic, all right? So I just wanted to uh, point out that this is not a random speed. Random speed is much higher. This is just the average velocity. That's uh, because um, the average, when you go on random back and forth, the velocity average becomes zero. But then if you have a small, uh, incline to one side, the average becomes non-zero. And that is the balance, you see, with the, which is 0.1 millimeter per second, very, very small. All right, any questions? Okay. So what is electric power? If you have a um, circuit like this with the uh, battery and the resistor and current going through it, uh, the ideal battery provides energy in the circuit and the resistor dissipates energy. We say that the resistor dissipates energy. Uh, it turns the energy into heat. As you remember from mechanics, power of a device is defined as the amount of work done or energy produced or consumed per unit time. So, this is the power as we remember from mechanics. P is W divided by T or U divided by T. The w is the, um, the work or the uh, U is the energy, uh, whichever you want to use. When a charge Q passes through a potential difference V, it gains or loses energy of magnitude U, which is Q times V, remember? that if a charge goes from here to here and there's a potential difference V here uh, as it is on the sides of the battery. So from here to here, uh, the charge loses this much energy, Q times V. And if it goes from here to back to here, it gains that much energy. When plus Q passes through a resistor, it loses energy U equal to Q times V because it goes from higher potential to lower potential. You know that the current is always in the direction of the electric field. And remember the electric field is always from higher potential to lower potential. And therefore, this, uh, when the current goes through the resistor always loses um, potential energy. And then when the same positive Q passes a battery from negative to positive, I should add here, 
it goes from lower potential to a higher potential. So it gains Q times V, energy equal to Q times V. The magnitude of the power in each case is this energy divided by the time. So it becomes, um, becomes uh, this U divided by time, QV divided by T. So QV divided by T and Q divided by T is I, right? So you can have I times V. So the power can be written as the current times voltage. And also because V equals to Ri, if you replace V by IR, it becomes I squared times R. Or if you re replace um, I by uh, V over R, becomes V squared over R. So all of these are the same formula. The unit of where power is what denoted by capital W and it's equal to one joule per second or one volt per amp. So P is equal to IV or, become, or equal to I squared R or equal to V squared over R. So you can use any of these uh, uh, forms depending on what you have. For example, if you have current and voltage, you can multiply them. If you have current and resistance, you can do I squared R, or if you have voltage and resistance, you can do V squared over R. Depending on what you have, it, these are all equivalent, and some of them are easier to use than the others, depending on the situation. All right? We use P equal to IV for batteries because they do not have resistance. So for batteries, we only use v, P equal to I times V. If the current that passes through the battery times the potential difference across the battery, right? Because usually the batteries are uh, characterized by potential difference across them. And we know how much current goes through them, but we don't know about the R because actually the ideal batteries don't have resistance. So we cannot use this one or this one, okay? This is the power output of the battery in a usual circuit. So when, when we calculate IV, we calculate the output power of the battery. When uh, usual, usual um, circuit means that the battery is providing current so the current goes out of the um, positive side and goes through the circuit and comes back to the negative side, all right? When the current is from the positive terminal toward the negative terminal. So this is what we mean by uh, usual circuit. But sometimes uh, you will see that this is not the case. Sometimes the, bar the current goes the opposite direction. Uh, if, if you have more than one battery, it may go one current to one battery may have opposite direction and goes to the positive side and goes out of the negative side. Um, sometimes batteries are being charged when the current is going into the positive terminal and out of the negative terminal. In this case, we can, uh, we can say that the power output of the battery is negative. So if if the current goes out of the plus side, the power output is positive, it means that the battery is providing energy. But if it is the current is the other way around, means that the current goes into the positive side, means positive charges go to the positive side, the current it is getting charged, so it absorbs energy. So we say the power output is negative. So the battery is gaining energy and its power output is negative. Okay, so in usual cases, I mean, with simple circuits like that, the power output is positive. But if you have two batteries, one may charge the other and then the power output of one of them is positive and the other one is negative, okay? And that's how we charge batteries these days. So it takes power. Any questions? All right, so this is electric power. We're going to solve problems with it. 
And then the last thing in this chapter is change of resistance with temperature. So what happens if you increase the temperature of a piece of wire? We say that the resistance increases. The resistance increases by temperature according to this uh, equation. This is the resistance, new resistance. This is the resistance at time T naught. This new resistance is at time, sorry, not time, temperature T naught. And uh, R is the res resistance at temperature T. R naught is the resistance at temperature T naught and alpha is the temperature coefficient of resistivity of the material in uh, degree Celsius inverse. Because you see, this is, this is O, this is also O. This is the degree Celsius to balance the uh, equation with units, alpha should have inverse of uh, degree Celsius as the unit. Resistivity of material changes and because when you, when you raise the temperature, the resistivity of material changes. And it follows the same rule, rho minus rho naught equal to rho naught alpha T minus T naught. And these are the uh, coefficient of resistivity, temperature coefficient of resistivity for different material. Aluminum has this much, brass has this much, copper has this much and so forth. And uh, carbon and graphite has a negative uh, value, but very small. It means that uh, the, the warmer it is, the less resistive it is. And that's a, that's a strength that, and a strange uh, characteristic that carbon has. I don't know exactly why really. Um, so um, these are experimental values. So uh, they, they did experiment and they came out with this came up with this uh, values. So uh, usually in the light bulbs, you have tungsten and in, uh, in wires, normal wires, you have copper. These are the two important ones that we deal with. Sometimes you have aluminum as well, all right? So, what happens uh, that the resistivity usually goes up is that when, uh, when the electrons are moving through the sample, as you, you saw, the electrons are moving, there are atoms here and other electrons that when you increase the temperature, the atoms are jiggling around and that increases the uh, probability of electrons hitting the atoms and also frequency of the uh, electrons hitting the atoms that increases resistivity and therefore it increases resistance, okay? That's the mechanism behind it. Any questions? All right. So uh, I guess that, that's all we have in this chapter. The rest is just applying these ideas to um, problems. This is an example problem. It says, figure shows a rectangular solid conductor of edge length L, 2L, and 3L, as you see in the figure. A potential difference V is to be applied uniformly between pairs of opposite faces of the conductor as figure B. For example, if this is this is uh, one face and this is another face. And these are the uh, um, electrodes that we can connect both sides. Of course, this, this middle one is this, right? And so we apply potential difference uh, on, on different faces, either um, front and back or left and right and top and bottom, okay? So we can apply different potential I mean, a potential difference across uh, opposite faces. So you have left, right faces, top, bottom faces, and front and back faces. So we can call them LR, TB, and FB. And um, 
we want to rank these pairs of faces uh, according to the magnitude of electric field need. So first, V is applied to between the left and right, sorry. Uh, then between top and bottom, the same voltage V and front and back. We want to rank these pairs, pairs of faces, greatest pairs according to the following, the magnitude of the electric field. Which one creates a larger, um, in which case you have larger electric field inside the material or inside the conductor? Can you tell? If you apply voltage this way between these two or between these pairs or between these pairs. This is top bottom. This one is left right and this is front back. Which one has more if you have the same voltage across, which one has more electric field? Can you tell? This is where you need to use your knowledge from previous chapters, chapter 24. What do you think? Top bottom, some uh, Jordan says top bottom and left and right, and then front and back. Would you want to explain why you decided that? How you decided that? All right, we said that uh, the voltage V is equal to integral of E dot DL, right? And integral E dot DL, if, if E is uniform and it is in the direction of DL, means that if you go from top to bottom directly, means uh, DL is in the same direction as E. So E dot DL becomes integral of E times L, DL. The dot product becomes just a multiple of their magnitudes because they are in the same direction. And then, of course, there's a negative sign that doesn't really matter here. Uh, and then E is uniform here. You see, as it's showing in here, E is uniform. Therefore, it comes out of the integral. So V becomes E times integral of DL and integral dl is the total length, e times l. So if you have v the same for all different sides, then the larger the l is, the smaller the electric field is, and vice versa. So the larger distance between uh, the two sides give you a smaller electric field. So for example, top bottom, for between top and bottom, uh, the distance is just L. So V is equal to E top bottom, let me write T B times L. And V is also equal to, V is also equal to E of, uh, let's say left and right, times what is the distance between left and right? You see, this is between left and right. The distance is 3L. Do you see that? So that's times 3L. And V is also equal to E 
front and back, and the distance between front and back is 2L. So you see, top bottom should be larger electric field, and then front and back. So E top bottom is larger than E top uh, front and back, and is larger than E of left and right. Does that make sense? The larger it is, the larger the distance, the smaller electric field has to be, and it will be. All right? So what about current density? In which, in which case is the current density larger? So, so far we said uh, E top bottom is the biggest, then E front and back, greater than E left and right. What about the current density? How can you decide? Anybody? Remember we said the uh, front back LR TB. Uh, all right, how did you get that? See, we said that uh, E was proportional to J, right? And we said E equals rho J and rho is the conduct uh, resistivity, J is current density. But it, they are all the same material, so rho is the same. So it means the, the larger the electric field is, the larger uh, current density. So J top bottom is also greater than J front and back, greater than J left, right. Make sense? Now, what about the current? In which, in which case the current is larger? Mm, no problem. All right. The current we can decide later. Well, can you say about the drift speed? Remember, drift speed is what? Is related to J is N, uh, it was NQ V drift, right? N is the same because it's the same material. Q is the same, so all electrons. So the larger drift, uh, larger J gives you larger drift speed. So for the last one also, VD for T top bottom is greater than VD for um, front and back and greater than VD left right. But about the current part C, You see that the larger uh, current I, let me write a formula so we can uh, get some idea. Current is J, J times A, J times area, right? Because J is current divided by area. So it happens that the larger J, which corresponds to the smaller L, 
it happens to have larger area too because volume is the same. So the larger the J is, the larger A also is. So it means the current is also the same way. So um, because um, we see for the top bottom, which has the smallest length, which gives you the largest electric field and largest uh, current density, it also has larger area. So larger current density and larger area gives you larger current. So uh, again, so I top bottom also is greater than I uh, front and back, greater than I left right. Make sense? All right, so you see in each case, I am actually applying a formula. I'm not just making it up. For example, for the first one, I said that uh, V equals to E times L, E times L, right? That gives us this one. And then E equals to rho times J, it gives you the second one. Then J is NQVD. So um, we're not just uh, giving an opinion, we just find, uh, realize, okay, is there a formula that can help us get to the right answer? Say every time I do that, I'm not just throwing things out from my intuition. All right, any questions? All right, here is an example. A common uh, flashlight light bulb is rated at 0.3 amps and a three volt. Means the voltage is three amps. Three volts, it takes two um, 1.5 volt batteries and it has a current of 0.3 amps. The values of the current and voltage under operation conditions are given. If the resistance of the tungsten pulp filament at room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, again, which is 20 degrees Celsius is 1.5, 1 ohm. What is the temperature of the filament when the bulb is on? Uh, you remember alpha for tungsten was this number, 0.0045 Celsius inverse. If the diameter of the filament is 12 micrometer, what is the current density in the filament? What is the drift speed of the electrons in the filament? Consider the carrier electron density of two times 10 to the 28 uh, charge carriers per meter cubed. So this is, this is the filament. You see it in the figure. Um, the filament is shown. This, this is the scale at 100 micrometer, which is 0.1 millimeter. So it's very, very, very small. So how do we do that? We say um, the resistant R minus R naught equal to R naught alpha T minus T naught. And we want to find the temperature. What is the temperature of the filament when the bulb is on? We have alpha we have uh, or not, if the resistance of the tungsten ball filament at room temperature is 1.1. So or not is 1.1. Oh, and alpha is that, if we want to find the temperature, this is what we want to find. And T naught is 20 degrees. So this uh, T naught is 20 degrees Celsius. And we know R naught. And then if you want, and we know alpha, if we want to find T, we need to find R. So we need to find R. How do we find R? From this information. Because R is equal to V over R. V equals to IR, remember? So V is three volts over 0.3 amps. So 
So that's 10 ohm. So R is 10 ohm, R naught is 1.1 ohm. So we can solve for T, T minus T naught is equal to R minus R naught divided by R naught alpha. So that is 10 minus 1.1 divided by 1.1 times 0 0.0045. That's 8.9 divided by this number. And how much is that? And then if it, once you find that, T becomes that plus 20. So I can say this is about uh, 0 0.005. That's about 200, right? One over 0 0.005 becomes 200 and 200 times 8.9 becomes almost that. Uh, we increase both, so 200 times nine comes 1800, right? And adding 20 is not very important plus 20, 18, 20. So the temperature of the, uh, the filament when it is on, it is about 1800 degrees Celsius, okay? Any questions? So this is part A. If the diameter of the filament is 12 microam, micrometer, sorry, what is the current density in the filament? So we found, uh, we know the current, with the current density is just um, current divided by area. The, the area is, the diameter is 12 micrometer. The area is pi, pi r squared, diameter is 12 micrometer, pi times six times 10 to the negative six meters square. So that becomes 36 times pi is about 100 times 10 to negative 12. So this area is about 10 to the negative 10. I'm just doing uh, approximate and uh, 10 to negative 10 meters squared. And then uh, the J becomes I divided by the area. So it becomes 0.3 divided by 10 to the negative 10 becomes times 10 to the 10 meter um, uh, current amps per meter square. So it becomes uh, 3 billion amps per meter square, three times 10 to the nine amps per meter square. And that is um, part B, is part A. And part C, what is the drift speed of the electrons? Um, you can know that the drift of CVD is equal to I, or if you find J, Become J divided by N times Q because J is N Q D V D and J you found N is given, Q is charge of electron. You can find that. All right. All right, I guess I stop here. There's one more problem, a couple of more problems. You can just try them by yourself until next time. Any questions? Nope. All right. So um, see you next time.